All right. This is called soda straw balcony because of the abundance of these soda straws as we see up here. So a soda straw is an individual spiliform that forms just like a soda straw. A drop of water emerges from the ceiling, degasses, calcite forms around the drop, and the pressure above keeps the drop coming down, precipitating, coming down, precipitating. It may take thousands, hundreds, decades, depending on the saturation state of the water, for that straw to form. And occasionally what will happen is that straw may get plugged up because it's not dripping as fast, or there's not enough hydrostatic pressure behind it, and that whole drop will get cemented over by calcite. In that case, then, the water pressure is still the same above it. It's got to find a way out, and it finds its way out through microfractures in the calcite lattice. That water emerges from then the side of the soda straw, and now the soda straw is being wetted on the outside, not from the inside, before it got plugged up. Now it starts growing outward as well as downward. And so some soda straws, they start out kind of uh, very skinny like straws, and sometimes they get kind of fatter, like those over there, that one over there. Okay, and sometimes they could get like super fat, like those back there. Those are really fat stalactites. Soda straw is one kind of stalactite, right? A stalactite is any formation tight to the ceiling that hangs downward, right? All of these formations that hang down from the ceiling all start out as soda straws, and then they get modified by that cementation process that I talked about. So what these soda straws are here is telling us where, over time, water has emerged from the Vedo zone above us. All right, so these are sort of speleothems here are frozen in records of where water flow has been in terms of spatial distribution. They're also, most of them are actually still active. And let's see if we could find one. Let's see if I could be steady here. Almost all of them have a drop on the end of them. And I'm just trying to get it so right there you could see the drop on the end of that one. Let's see if I could find one with a better droplet on it. Yeah, this one. Uh, there's a good one. So there's a drop right on the end of that and we could stay here and take drip rates and that's going to take a long time for that drop to come. But eventually it will drop. And it's all about drip rate. So what you see here is that if you if everyone would be quiet for like three seconds. I didn't hear any water splashing. There'll be other parts of the cave where we could hear it. Oh, you could hear it over there. But in this area here, nothing has been dripping since we've been here, which is about 10 minutes now. Okay, so I want to pose a question to you here. What would you infer about the nature of flow paths? We talked about this on our previous trip of conduit flow paths versus diffuse flow paths through an aquifer, right? Diffuse flow is through the, the microscopic pore network that all aquifer rocks have, be it a limestone or a sandstone aquifer. But what's unique to limestone aquifers is the abundance of conduits, these big channels, these big pipes. So I want you to compare and contrast both the flow rate and the spatial distribution of the speleothem, the stalactites here, and think about this, would you call this relatively homogeneous or heterogeneous distribution? And then compare that with these stalactites here, which are thicker and aligned along a fracture, whoa, it goes all the way back to here, in the ceiling. Okay, how would you compare these in terms of heterogeneity or homogeneity of their distribution? Would this be more or less homogeneous compared to, to those? More homogeneous. Yes. So this would represent a relatively diffuse flow system, whereas this, where the water seems to be coming through a fracture, would be represent, represent a more conduit flow system. And I'm comparing this both in terms of spatial distribution and the thickness of the formations. All of the things being equal, the thicker formation represents more water flow. So there, it's heterogeneous and thicker. It's consistent with conduit flow path. Here, homogeneous and thinner, consistent with a more diffuse flow path. So we've been talking quite a bit about conduit versus diffuse flow paths right. in these aquifers. Why should we worry about that? 
Well, as a window into an aquifer, we can infer something about the flow path of water uh, based on the, the conduit or diffuse nature of the drip site that uh, is in question. For example, if you have a contaminant spill above ground and the contaminants are making their way into the aquifer, um, if they were going through a diffuse network, we would expect that they would take a lot longer time and experience much more filtration than if they were entering the aquifer through a conduit network. Sounds like something we really need to worry about and be able to map out. This may be one way to make those assessments. Other studies we're doing is actually looking at geochemical changes. Conduit versus diffuse flow paths will produce very different geochemical changes in the drip water. The diffuse flow path is a longer residence time. It's a more torturous flow pathway, so the water spends more time in the aquifer as a result. And also there's a higher surface area, mineral surface area, to volume of water contact than think about a conduit where it's coming through faster and there's a lot of water relative to the surface area of that conduit. Those things make the geochemical evolution of conduit versus diffuse water very, very different and tractable in favorable circumstances. So just by looking at the chemical composition, are, is one more limestone-like in its composition or is one more soil-like? Because if it's all leaving the soil with the same signature, it's going to be modified through a diffuse flow path much more towards the limestone composition. And we can use that in the modern aquifer for mapping out conduit versus diffuse flow diffuse flow paths, but if you could do it in the ancient, you can actually make links to climate change. Because when recharge rates are really high, what happens is there's a lot of rainfall, a lot of recharge, the diffuse flow pathways, their capacity gets filled up. If their capacity gets filled up, the water has to find its way down another high capacity pathway, and that's a conduit pathway. So if we see a speleothem, with a conduit signal changing to a diffuse signal over time at the same drip site, right, that same formation. We see this in many different aquifer systems, both here in Texas, in the Caribbean. We see these changes from conduit to diffuse type water chemistry as recorded in single speleothems. That's telling us that over time we're shifting from high rates of recharge to low and from that we infer changes in rainfall. Okay. One more thing I wanted to mention about uh, etiquette in the caves, if at all possible, don't touch anything. If we touch these formations, we can actually inhibit the growth of the calcite. We have dirt and oils on our fingers, and if we transfer that to the formation, that'll create a hydrophobic layer, and the water will run off, and the calcite won't precipitate. So it could actually kill formations by, by touching them too much. You can love a speleothem to death. This is also an interesting point in the cave to, now that we're just starting out, to talk about the commercialization of the cave. So we'll talk about how the cave was discovered, but once it was discovered, we'll do that in a little bit, but once the cave was discovered, the people who owned it had some choices to make about how you develop it. And sort of there's this sort of range of considerations. You want to be able to have people be able to come through and be a tourist and enjoy the cave and be able to see the cave. And that's weighed against keeping the cave in as close to its natural state of beauty as possible, right? Given that some of these formations we've talked about take 70,000 years to grow, you could easily trample that in a, in a second. So one of the considerations is how do you give people access? And here is one example. This pathway we're standing on is not just the anthropogenic influence. It's not just that this was paved to make it easy for people to walk, right? If this was, it's always wet in the cave because of the drips. And if you keep the natural soil dirt surface, it's going to turn to mud. And if it's muddy, then people are going to have a really hard time navigating things. So they put in, they put in these pavements, they put in these lit pathways, they, right? They bring in artificial lighting. But one big thing they do is try to make it easy for people to walk through. So what we're standing on right now, we could see some of the natural strata here. We could trace it across to there. This was once continuous, right? It, probably could say with a high degree of confidence that the level of the cave floor was right up here and it came off and sloped down sl slightly, but that was then the level of the cave floor there. So we were probably right about arm's level is where the floor of the cave was. And they came in and they removed everything from my arm down and hauled it out of the cave to make it easy to walk through. Otherwise, if the level of the cave floor was here, right, between there and there, then 
you'd have this much room to try to get in and it would be immediately crawling tour and that would greatly limit the number of people could see so you have to weigh all of the factors involved between wanting to preserve things in its natural state this is someone's private property they can do with it whatever they want and if they want to make as much money as possible uh, like good entrepreneur would that's another consideration how do you weigh all those and is there a happy medium to be struck in between those and if you clearly left the floor here then only a certain uh, level of person could make it through here right there would be people who were in the Navy SEALs and uh, people who were doing CrossFit for about two years straight would be able to pull their way through and like the adventure. You can see some evidence of uh, actually how they did this work. Those are not uh, the borings of a, uh, of a fossil that was boring through the sediment. Those are, actually, uh, those are actually blast holes where they cored a hole, then put their explosive in there, and then went somewhere far away and remotely set it off and blew that face of the rock off and came and carried this stuff out. Okay. So we're taking CO2 measurements and we have the CO2 meter several meters that way. We're really interested in CO2, but we want to make sure it's uh, as close to the natural level in the cave as possible. If we set it down here, we're, humans are nothing more than walking CO2 vectors. Your breath has about 40,000 ppm CO2 in it. So that's a good datum for you guys to record in your notes. Soda Straw Balcony, or the location ISSB, 1,700 parts per million. And on the surface, does anybody remember what it was? It was 418. 